one of our uh, member organizations and a sponsor of uh, our conference is the Public Service Alliance of Canada. And Sherry Hunt is a proud member of PSAC and a board member and chairs our Child Care Task Force. So Sherry's going to emcee the session. Please welcome Sherry. Mine was certainly uh, very interesting and I enjoyed it very much, but one of the questions that came out of it from the group was, okay, we have all these bright ideas, what are we going to do with it and how are we going to make it happen? And that's why I'm very excited about this panel today. Uh, the title of the panel is Effective Organizing for People and the Planet, and we have with us three uh, wonderful women who have been working on advocacy and activism and have had some success stories and some ways of doing advocacy that maybe are not uh, first choice or first, uh, first one that we go to as advocates and they're going to share their stories with us today. So without further ado, our first guest is Laura Benson. She is director of the Dogwood Institute Beyond Coal Campaign. Um, she's a master's degree in urban studies from the Simon Fraser University and 15 years of experience working on organizing advocacy campaigns in British Columbia, California, and Oregon. Or Oregon. Um, she lives on top of Burnaby Mountain with her husband, her two sons, and her cat, which we all know cat people make the best Ooh. activists. <laughs> Ooh, well, well, Thank you. That's <laughs> Um, well, thank you so much. It's really exciting to be here, um, and thank you, Bill, for inviting me to come and speak about dogwood. Oh, look, I just changed something I did, changed the color. Weird. Mm -hmm. Anyway, um, so I'm going to start by telling you a little bit about my corner of the world. Um, this is a picture of a rally opposing Kinder Morgan's proposed Trans Mountain Pipeline. Anybody ever heard of that? Yeah. Um, at Burnaby Mountain Park in Coast Salish Territory. And this is just uphill from the marine terminal where the park pipeline would end and oil would be loaded on the giant tankers bound for Asia. Um, and this park was the site of a dramatic face-off between local protesters and Kinder Morgan contractors last fall, which you may have heard about. Um, the contractors, Kinder Morgan insisted on violating our local conservation laws in order to drill core samples, testing the viability of carving a pipeline straight through our mountain. Um, now, keep in mind, this is a proposal that has not been approved, has not even made it through the regulatory process yet, but they still felt it was necessary to come and break our local laws. Um, I live about a mile away on the top of this mountain with my husband and our two boys, we rode our bikes to this rally. Um, so for me, Dogwood's work to stop dangerous fossil fuel export projects um, and bolster local democratic decision making literally hits home. Um, since I was a tantrum throwing toddler, I've been kind of obsessed with fairness. I'm guessing I'm not alone in this room <laughs> with that. Um, so it's no surprise that when I grew up I made my career in social change, and it's no surprise that things like fair wages, civil rights, environmental protection, climate change were all equally important in my work and in my values. Um, so I, I really found my philosophical home working in the U.S. environmental justice movement at an organization called Environmental Health Coalition in San Diego, California. I worked directly with a team of local organizers and residents in a low-income Latino neighborhood that sits right next to the port uh, and has a crazy mix of, uh, of industry, people, and traffic. So it was my job to be the liaison to seats of power, to the city and state government, to the port authority, to industry roundtables, to ensure that local people had a voice in the decisions that were affecting their neighborhood, and, and even more, had a chance to shape the future of their neighborhood. So when my family went to BC in 2008, I was looking for a similar work. Um, clearly, environmental justice work has been happening in indigenous communities in Canada since the time of first contact, and I think we're going to hear more about that later from Jacqueline. 
and the labor movement has a very solid history and of, of organizing, grassroots organizing. But otherwise, it didn't seem there was like there was a lot of work out there for an older organizer like me until I found saw a posting from Dogwood Initiative for a coal campaigner. Um, so Dogwood Initiative brings together everyday British Columbians to reclaim decision-making power over our air, land, and water. So, okay, I thought, well, democracy and local power and important decisions? Check. Campaigns to stop the expansion of the worst fossil fuel abetting infrastructure projects in my backyard? Check. And then at the interview, they talked to me about organizing. I was totally sold. Uh, and luckily, the feeling was mutual. So that was two years ago. And unbeknownst to me, I came to Dogwood at a crucial turning point for the organization. Um, the provincial election was only two weeks away, and it had become the focal point for Dogwood's five-year-old uh, No Tankers campaign. British Columbians had lost faith in the federal review process for pipeline projects and public opinion. The tide of public opinion had turned against these proposals. A majority of British Col Col Columbians were now opposed. Um, so the, the provincial government holds this really important trump card on these, uh, on these proposals because it has to, uh, to approve dozens of permits for the practical work of building a pipeline, even if the federal government um, approves the project. So we needed a provincial government that would refuse those permits. Um, now, a lot of you were probably paying attention to what happened in that election. Everyone thought the NDP was going to win by a landslide for the first time in decades. Um, the party had already taken a position opposing the Endwick Northern Gateway project, and midway through the campaign took a sort of clumsy surprise position opposing the Kinder Morgan proposal as well. So we thought we had won, we could pack up and go home, but then the NDP lost in a surprise, dramatic political upset, one of the most dramatic results I've ever seen. Um, and at Dogwood, despite having grown our base of support to over 100,000 people, um, we were only able to mobilize election volunteers in a handful of provincial writings, and we, weren't, we didn't really move enough votes to affect the outcome in, in, of the election, except maybe in our home writing in Victoria. I mean, luckily the political winds were such that the ruling party had also been forced to take a pretty tough position on pipeline and tanker projects. So our, the woman who's now our premier, Christy Clark, campaigned in a pledge to stand up for BC and came up with these famous five conditions for accepting a pipeline project in British Columbia. But we didn't think we could trust her. Uh, and we, we were facing an identity crisis in the organization because we had made a, made a conscious decision at Dogwood starting in, two, in 2010 to build a formidable, resilient, nonpartisan force to change the way decisions are made on fossil fuel infrastructure projects in BC. So, it, it, if you remember, I was hired to work on coal. Can you get the light right on the screen? When you have the well, if I hold it, if I hold it, no. no. It's really... Yeah. I'm sorry. If I hold it in a certain way, <laughs> is that a little better? Okay, I'm going to try to keep holding this awkwardly over here while I'm speaking. Um, <laughs> so at the at this, at this same moment, uh, BC had come into the sights of desperate U.S. thermal coal companies who faced a dying domestic market in the U.S. as, uh, as Americans turned away from coal for energy. And this industry sees its only hope in exporting its stuff to hungry Asian markets. So when prices were high in 2011, um, a couple of producers got their, their foot in the door here at West Shore Terminals. Um, and coal companies started uh, proposing a whole whack of new coal ports up and down the coast of North America. Now in BC, we've exported coal, metallurgical coal for years, for decades. Um, so we have existing coal terminals. Whereas our neighbors in Washington and Oregon have no coal ports, and the proposals there would have to be built from scratch. Um, now, in BC, as of 2013, we have the capacity to ship up to 65 million metric tons of coal, and if all the proposed expansions were to go through, we could ship 
87 and a half million metric tons of coal. Um, but meanwhile, to the south, a wave, a powerful wave of public opposition and extensive years long environmental reviews were holding up the, the proposals to build coal ports there. So one project changed the, the outlook here and gave us a chance to draw a line in the sand uh, in BC and up and down the, the west coast. Uh, and that was a proposal to transship US coal from Montana and Wyoming by rail to BC, transfer it onto barges on the Fraser River, take, it, take the barges up to Texada Island, and then transfer it again onto ships bound for Asia. Sounds like perfect efficiency, right? Um, but it's the quickest way for US mining companies to get their product to market. Um, and our lax environmental laws and existing terminals made it look easy. Uh, so local climate activists and community groups luckily noticed and started to make a ruckus. And meanwhile, the Power Pass Coal Coalition in the US realized that all their work to kill coal port proposals on their shores would be moot if the industry could just keep on going up to BC and ship out of British Columbia. Um, so that's where Dogwood came in. We joined the Power Pass Coal Coalition as a Canadian partner, and uh, we brought our assets to the burgeoning local grassroots movement against that Fraser Street Ox proposal. I don't know, I might have moved my hand. Is it looking weird again? No. Okay. Um, so, in the first 18 months of the campaign, uh, this is what we were able to achieve, because uh, what Dogwood's strength, in addition to that link to the U.S. movement, um, Dogwood brought it that unique marriage of big list campaigning, online campaigning with grassroots community organizing, um, and more than anything, that ability to build, build a large base of British Columbians around an issue and connect them to points of power at key decision moments. So that's why... We, we were able to build this base of 46,000 people who signed on to petitions, 8,000 people petitioning, you know, sending letters to the federal and provincial government, um, and stand behind our allies as they pushed 14 municipal and regional governments to pass resolutions of concern and opposition and, and important support from other constituencies. So, but remember that identity crisis I was talking about at the organization? It was happening at the same time as we were launching this new campaign. Um, and it led to some big changes. We needed an organizing model that would build long-term, resilient political power for local people. And we needed an insurance policy in case our elected governments failed us and approved those tanker and pipeline proposals. Approved. Did I say approved? Approved. Um, so we decided our Let B, or we launched our Let BC Vote campaign, and it's based on BC's unique legislation that allows us, allow, essentially allows citizens to write our own laws if we can get petition signatures from 10% of registered voters in all of the 85 writings in the province. Easy, right? No problem. Um, so if the, this is sort of our, our democratic concern in insurance policy. If the federal government approved the pipeline projects against BC's objections, like they did last year on the Enbridge Northern Gateway project, um, and the provincial government caved on its promise to, promise to stand up for BC, and First Nations lawsuit, lawsuits fail, we still have a chance to kill the projects at the provincial level. So we needed 10% of voters in each of those 85 writings, and we'd have to get those signatures in 90 days once we trigger that citizens' initiative uh, legislation that we have in BC. So instead of doing that, we decided to get prepared ahead of time. We decided to sign up 15% of registered voters in all the writings, um, and we figured that that, that would add up to 481,587 people, and we need about 10,000 volunteers to do it, just so we could be ready ahead of time. How the hell are we going to do that? We had to organize. We knew we had to organize. Um, but we had to find a way to go big and go deep really fast. We knew we couldn't just be a, a collectivist organi organization online. We had to get out to the grassroots um, and, and get people mobilized. Um, so we adapted a distributed organizing model that campaigners used to elect and re-elect Barack Obama. Um, in the U.S., a model conceptualized by Marshall Gans, 
uh, that's visualized as a snowflake. So this is sort of a diagram of a part of, a, of what a snowflake looks like. It relies on storytelling to build relationships as the glue that holds people together in a common cause. And it builds a distributed network of teams that use issue-based tools like petitions and vote pledges to build a larger and larger base of political support um, for de democratic decision making on, on fossil fuel projects. Um, let me skip this. So this is just a snapshot of what our teams look like, our snowflake teams look like in the Capital Region District in, in the Victoria area. Um, we now have over 100 teams in 37 of those 85 provincial ridings. Um, we have a list of contactable supporters, equivalent to 15% of, of registered voters in 34 of those ridings. Uh, and a bunch more ridings are really close. Um, and that's after about 16 months of organizing under this new model. Uh, so now Dogwood is BC's largest nonpartisan democracy group. <laughs> Um, so, just a quick example, I'm probably running out of time here, um, but just a quick example of what that means. So, the thing is, once you get organized, then you're organized. <laughs> and so, it works if we want to launch a citizen's initiative, and it works for any other key moment that comes along, any other key decision-making moment that, where we can mo mobilize this political force. So, the first opportunity we had to test that um, was in our last fall's municipal elections in British Columbia. Um, so, we, our campaigns, our Beyond Coal campaign teamed up with our Let BC Vote campaign to target some key municipal races, practice our organizing skills, build the strength of our teams, and help elect candidates who would stand up for local decision-making power. Um, we surveyed candidates, we posted responses on a website, and uh, ranked, highlights, some, highlighted some of the champions among them, um, and then launched a traditional get out the vote effort with our teams in seven municipalities. I'm sure all of you are, are highly familiar with a traditional get out the vote effort. You probably do it every time um, an election rolls around, and you'll be doing it again probably tomorrow. Uh, so, what that means is uh, we, between 180 volunteer organizers from 17 of Dogwood's teams, we were able to contact 19,625 voters in, that, in those municipal elections. Um, in our seven target cities where we highlighted candidates, the average voter turnout went up by 26%. That's double the provincial average of, of increase in, in voter turnout. And it gets better. So we were able to do a really close analysis of voter turnout in the city of Vancouver, and we found that um, supporters, Dogwood supporters who received a Get Out the Vote email were 61% more likely to vote than the average. Now, if supporters got a live call from a real Dogwood volunteer um, in the final days before the campaign, they were 82% more likely to vote. So it works, it works. And it elected 27 of those 35 candidates that we highlighted as champions. Um, and then the, in the municipality of Souk, where they ran a, a plebiscite on, uh, what was it, a no tankers plebiscite, it passed by 70%. Wow. What, what passes by 70%, right? <laughs> like this, dictators get 70%, it's crazy. <laughs> so, um, I think I'm probably, I probably should leave, I'm out of time, I should hand it over to Kelly. Um, if you want to know another example of how we use this marriage of online and offline <laughs> campaigning, and you want to talk about the grumpy cat friendly lady strategy, ask me later. Um, but <laughs> I'll just sum up by saying, um, We've, we've learned a lot in the past couple of years about what it takes to organize a nonpartisan non political force. Um, and we know we have to do it because that's how we're going to get to the promised land. Um, the, the fight to block investment in crude oil pipelines and coal ports in BC 
is a lot like the fight to close the El Dorado gold mine in Greece that we saw in, in Abby Lewis's video yesterday. Um, and I'm going to quote one of the guy, the, the guy who was in that video, who said, these are the no's that have to be said before the yeses. And we'll never get to the yeses unless we look, build local power that lasts. So that's what we're trying to do at Dogwood. And so far, so good. <laughs> Um, our next guest um, has, over the past 15 years, she's been a scholar and a <coughs> participant in citizen-based movements and initiatives supporting participatory, participatory democracy. And I'm going to stop saying big words now because obviously I can't do it. But anyway, um, currently she's working with Leave Now, and I'd like to introduce Kelly Dow Dow Dow. <laughs> one of the campaign managers with Lead Now. Um, Lead Now is an independent advocacy organization. We were founded in 2011 um, in the lead up to the previous federal election um, with the goal of holding the government accountable and activating Canadians uh, to become full on participants in our democratic processes. Um, so thanks to the wonderful job that Laura did, <laughs> um, we use a very similar model uh, called engagement organizing um, it's actually the same model that blends online tactics and online activation and engagement with more traditional models of offline organizing and community uh, community empowerment. Okay, um, I'll keep going. There we go. Hey, to Cheryl. And I'm going to have to hold this so that Fantastic. Um, yeah, so um, our model is based on people power change and uh, we're part of a, an international network of other similar minded organizations that function in um, much the same way, uh, starting with our biggest sister, Move On in the United States, uh, Get Up in Australia, uh, 38 Degrees in the UK um, and us and many, many others that are starting to join, uh, sign on to this model of realizing how effective it is and can be um, and uh, yeah, just becoming part of the family. So really happy about that. Um, so why do I do what I do? I joined Lead Now in May of last year uh, as a campaign manager for our online campaigns. It's been a great ride so far. Uh, a little bit about me, so I, I'm a born and bred Albertan. <laughs> And um, also like Laura, from a very young age, I had many a temper tantrum about whether or not something was fair. It was a rallying cry in my school, on the playground, in my home with my brother, um, and being a child uh, of the Klein Revolution, um, my very, very first protest was when Klein was wanting to cancel kindergarten. And there was just something innate in me, I was maybe 15. I was like, that's not fair, it's not fair. Um, and so it was really interesting to kind of jump in at that point in time and um, see what was going on. Uh, at that time, I didn't really have the analysis of neoliberal policies or conservative government or really understanding what was going on. It was just that in a sense of justice um, that really drove me to getting involved. Um, fast forward a number of years, I took a long-ish uh, detour through Mexico. Um, traveled there a number of times and in different capacities. I worked there, I studied there, um, and it was really uh, 
really changed my worldview. Um, I was on a path, the first reason I went down to Mexico, I was going to get a job with an oil company. And I was going to be their PR spokesperson to go down like many I had seen um, in families around me, including in my own family, uh, to convince communities why fossil fuel development and the construction of pipelines was awesome. That's what I was going to do. And, and so I had to go to Mexico and learn Spanish uh, <laughs> to figure out how to do that. Um, and it was there that I came in touch with the long, long, long history of social movements and mobilizations there. And specifically in the region where I was at, I went to Chiapas and um, could not escape the influence of the Zapatista movement that was um, still in full force there. Um, I was there in 2001. That photo is from 2001 and a massive mobilization of hundreds of thousands of people who showed up in the main square in Mexico City, really demanding that the government make good on the, um, the ratification of an accord that they had struck with these indigenous communities to respect their rights and culture. Um, obviously that didn't, uh, didn't transpire, and um, later on I went back uh, to study the ways that those communities were really using deep, radical, grassroots democracy um, to try and really just create a life of dignity for themselves. Um, they had rejected, obviously, NAFTA, um, called NAFTA a death, death sentence for the way of life, and it was interesting, it was just that it flipped the switch for me that not everyone wants to live the way we live here. And actually, the way we live here is destructive to their way of life, and it's obviously becoming apparent it's destructive to our own way of life as well. Um, and so in 2006, I finished off my master's degree there, understanding how the social movements um, which, I mean, it was a banner year for social movements in Mexico, really, between teachers' unions, um, again, a counter-campaign to the federal elections, um, and the responding movement after the electoral fraud that happened. Um, it was a really interesting, um, a very important time for me. And while I was away, um, Stephen Harper joined, well, <laughs> got into government um, as a minority government, first of all, and coming home, starting to connect the dots between what was going on in my country, what was going on in other countries, how this sort of massive global movement um, towards neoliberalization, which we've heard um, plenty about in the past day or two, um, really had an effect. And so in 2011, hearing these words, a strong, stable, conservative majority government, yeah, like let that sink in. Remember how you felt <laughs> when you heard those words? It was pretty, uh, pretty demoralizing and pretty um, shocking to me. And trying to figure out how to do uh, something about it became um, a real priority in my life. And that's when I first heard about Lead Now. Um, some of you might remember back at that time there were these things happening around campuses across the country called vote mobs. Um, you know, these massive mobilizations of young kids going out to vote. And I looked like huh, they're doing some really creative stuff, that's interesting. So I signed up on their list and they continued on with a campaign around cooperation. I was like, yeah, that makes sense. You know, get the progressive parties to start cooperating on policy and agreeing to work together, that's a great idea. Um, and so for a long time, I just kind of flirted around the edges of uh, the stuff that they were doing, signed a petition here and there. And uh, as I said, in May, I was lucky enough to join their team and it's been a really great fit uh, for all of these reasons. Um, so, we ha have a community um, of participants in our different actions that's formed over the past four years. We just passed 400,000 Canadians uh, recently, and so that was really exciting. Um, we've got about 15 staff who work across the country. We've got folks in Victoria and Vancouver, um, where we're excellent allies and do lots of work together with Dogwood, um, and have learned a lot from them as well. Uh, there are two of us based out of Calgary, and we've got a handful in Toronto and a staff member in Ottawa as well. Um, pitch, we are hiring, so if you want to check out our, our website, we're looking for some organizers and an online campaigner to join our team, so you can uh, check that out if that's of interest to you. Um, but yeah, that's what our community is about. And really, we envision a country where people work together uh, to build an open democracy, create a fair economy, and ensure a safe climate for all generations. I think as we've heard a lot, um, especially it came up a lot in our workshop uh, session, about how all of these things are interconnected. We can't really have one without the other. Um, it's, it's really, really important to keep that in mind, that as we're, we're in our struggles from our positions, 
to look out more broadly and remember, you know, what we're doing, if we're organizing around healthcare, is reinforcing our organizing and our people power and our citizen muscles to reinforce or support other work that's going on around democracy or around climate. So um, we see these as three intersecting issues. Obviously, these are issues that, through lots of consultations with our community, have been the ones that have risen to the fore. Um, and so those are the ones that we generally focus our energies on. We're really lucky that they are broad issues. Um, we're unlucky in that uh, we could really be campaigning on dozens of issues every single day. Uh, so we try and uh, keep our sanity in, in different ways uh, to do that. But really what our approach is about is taking what's isolated, invisible, and powerless and turning it into something that's connected, visible, and therefore powerful. And so a lot of our work involves building some strategic leadership or providing that strategic leadership as well as technology uh, to mobilize the resources that we have as citizens. So these are just a few examples. Um, we all have opinions, we all have a, an ability to vote, creativity, relationships, experience, and our material resources. Um, I'm not going to read these all out loud, I'll just let you take a look at them. So we really take um, a three-pronged approach um, in our strategy. Uh, one is through campaigning, uh, through engagement, and also through organizing. And so I'll go through a little bit about some examples of that and then provide an example of one of our most recent campaigns that involves all three of those elements. So starting in 2011, um, Lee now has run campaigns on a broad, broad range of issues. Again, we're a multi-issue organization, um, and that gives us a lot of room to play and a lot of room to have fun. Um, the, we tend to focus on federal issues. When, we, when and if we have extra capacity and interest, we can uh, flirt with the municipal and the provincial levels. Um, but uh, some of our most successful campaigns have been uh, stopping the Canada-China, we didn't stop it, trying to stop the Canada-China FIPA um, accord um, and working to support First Nations legal struggles uh, with relationship to that trade agreement, um, as well as building alliances. A lot of this work we've done in partners, the Defend Our Climate, Defend Our Communities work has been in uh, conjunction with Forest Ethics and other environmental NGOs. Um, obviously healthcare is a big thing and uh, I'll talk a little bit about our C51 campaign which is where our funny little moose meme came from. Um, and obviously right at the top there is our Vote Together campaign, so that's our election campaign. I won't have time to touch on that today, but I'm happy I'll be around for the next uh, 24 hours or so to uh, answer any questions about that in particular. Um, but. All of the work that we're doing, um, especially right now in 2015, is really about mobilizing people, getting them engaged, and helping to bridge them into an understanding that these particular specific issues that you care about, whether it's online privacy or whether it's healthcare, whether it's omnibus bills or crime legislation, it all trickles up to the top in terms of who is governing our country who's making those decisions and, and setting those priorities. And so getting involved in our elections is something that we heard loud and clear from our community that they wanted to do, they wanted to be involved in, and so we put together our election campaign uh, related to that, and happy to take questions on that. So um, the other thing that Lee now has done from the start is engagement. Um, it's not just a bunch of us on our webcams every week going, hmm, what should we campaign on this week? Uh, it really has come from a long process from the very beginning of talking face to face with other people, inviting them into gatherings, inviting them into conversations, and trying to figure out from them and hear from them what their priorities are and what their interests are and where their energies lie. We can't do the work we do if people aren't energized and really passionate about the issues. And so we want to hear from them and try and consult them at least on an annual basis. Um, more so now we're trying to get some more frequent consultation through some online surveys that we're going to get up and running. But uh, through our Connect activity, or through our Connect event, which was last uh, spring, and a number of ones that preceded that, as well as our Spark event, which has helped um, influence our strategies and tactics around our election campaign that took place in the fall of 2014, um, as well as our Skills for Solidarity program. Um, that ran over the summer of 2014. We heard loud and clear from our community that in addition to democracy, climate, and economy, there was an emerging issue in how do we show our solidarity and recognize um, the great privilege that we have of being on this land as settlers. 
um, and how do we build solidarity with our First Nations communities, understanding that, you know, in a lot of ways, it's only because of them and because of the treaties that they've signed that um, we're able to hold off some of the worst development projects um, in the fossil fuel kind of industry. So um, that's, that's how we've engaged our community in different ways. And then um, really the theory is by getting them involved, having them engage in or participate in more simple, um, easy clicktivism online action stuff you can do in your pajamas from your computer. Um, that's obviously not enough, but we are able to harness the power that we're building um, in our <coughs> online world and through our lists and through our data to mobilize people to get them out into the streets and show their power when it's really, really necessary. Um, so, and, and every now and then we actually get invited, we get invited to go speak at parliament, parliamentary committees. Um, we delivered with our partners at Open Media our petition on our C51 campaign a couple weeks ago. Uh, we went to talk to, with the parliamentary committee around the Reform Act as well. And so part of that is, you know, getting access to power because we've had, um, we've built the soft power, the people power um, outside. So, just as a quick example as to how our process kind of works, um, some of you may be familiar with our Stop C51 campaign, I hope. Um, this, we, as soon as the legislation came out, it was actually funny, we had just sent out an email um, trying to do a preemptive strike around bailouts for big oil leading up to the presentation of the federal budget. And it went out the day before the legislation on C-51 came out, and we got all these emails, we're like, why aren't you campaigning on C-51? I was like, because we haven't seen the legislation yet. But it comes out tomorrow, and, um, and we launched our campaign soon after. Um, again, the role of partnerships has been really important. As I mentioned, in this case, we partnered immediately with um, Open Media. We've got a good relationship with them as well, and knew that they were interested from sort of the online surveillance perspective of what this legislation was going to do. Um, we had an interest in it from you know, the ideas around preventative detention and turning CSIS into a police force. Um, those kinds of things were really, really worrisome from our perspective. And so we were able to kind of share what our framing was going to be, what our strategies were going to be, and how we were going to activate our communities. When we were going to activate them sort of in isolation and when we would do the work to bring them together so that we could really show our, show our force of power. So it started as many um, online campaigns do with an online petition. Um, we started it on our u.leadnow.ca platform, which is a community platform that any of you can use to start your own online petitions. Um, it's out there and available. Um, we provide uh, some support along the way. And uh, so we use that platform um, to launch our first petition. We were able to blast it out to our community, so we sent it out to our full list. and. Uh, started seeing the signatures roll in and started seeing them come in and we were getting very excited about that. It was, it was good to see those numbers grow and that it, this issue really resonated with a lot of people. Um, we played up with social media. Uh, we created lots of fun graphic shares. This one was actually, we had a, a visiting person from our sister organization in Get Up and she created this moose meme. Um, really trying, what we were trying to point out is, you know, where are the priorities and how is the government trying to play on our fears of the other, of the terrorists, of um, people who are different than we are, um, you know, jeopardizing, or not jeopardizing, um, capitalizing on the October 21st shootings, those sorts of things, how they were playing that up and sort of playing a bit with the absurdity of it all. Um, it is true, you are more likely to be killed by a police than a, a terrorist act in Canada. Um, but how, so we just thought it was a funny way to kind of highlight that, um, those fear tactics that the government was using. We did a bunch of fundraising, we created a three minute video, just letting people know sort of what the worst aspects of the bill were. Um, this was actually one of the first campaigns too that we were able to do fully in a bilingual way. And so um, our emails went out in French and English, our video was produced in French and English through the support of amazing volunteers who do our translations and uh, a volunteer voiceover artist as well. Uh, so that was great. And time. Oh, no. Um, and then we like activated thousands of people out onto the streets on March 14th uh, for a National Day of Action. We've done other things as well and have developed a click-to-call tool that just went out this morning so you can call your MPs. Um, and we're looking forward to next week's week of education. Just really quick results, like so what? What's the point of activating all of these people? You can see some of the stats there, but really what's been most important for us is seeing the public support for this legislation plummet. 
It was 82% when the bill first came out, 45% a couple weeks ago, and just this morning I read it's down to 33%. We don't know if it's going to make a difference once the vote comes. There are lots of problems, but at least we know that we've made a difference in terms of people understanding how dangerous this legislation is, how um, it is the Harper government, and to the extent other political parties that are supporting um, this legislation and agreeing to vote for it that's problematic. So. Oh, I'm going to be clicking and calling my MP. He's, he's a real piece of work. Um, <laughs> our next guest, um, she works with the Mother Earth Action Cooperative and currently in partnership with other ENGOs uh, to bring environmental justice to disenfranchised groups and communities. Um, Jacqueline Fayent um, has, has extensive experience working with marginalized communities and has enjoyed um, her her communities, her specialization in community development. So, welcome. Thank you. So I don't have a PowerPoint, um, so I'm just going to read from my notes. Um, that's just the way I roll since I go into northern communities and sometimes technology technology doesn't always work with you. So um, first of all, let me say start by saying Tanse. I would like to take a moment to give thanks to the indigenous peoples of this land for the sharing of this land in accordance with natural laws and treaties. I acknowledge their sovereignty. I am a Cree French Metis. My family clan name is Fayant and my family roots are strongly grounded in the Fishing Lake Métis Settlement, I'm about three and a half hours from here. My ceremonial name is Soke Monape Casawino Sesquelos, which in translation means strong warrior woman. Some have said challenging uh, woman. <laughs> Depends on who you talk to. Um, so I too come into this role naturally, I think. Um, I have been working as a Tar Sands campaigner for the Mother Earth Action Cooperative for approximately four months. Uh, we are a brand new organization, still wet behind the ears, and as a campaigner, I'm still wet behind the ears, although I've worked in social justice for many years. The Mother Earth Action Cooperative is a nonprofit educational and community service cooperative registered with the provinces of Saskatchewan and Alberta. MIAC promotes education and awareness in the topic areas of environment, ecology, social justice, peace, indigenous solidarity, while moving to a non-nuclear and non-fossil fuel energy future, and deepening the quality alternatives to democracy and envisioning sustainable global capitalism. Currently, we work in partnership with Beaver Lake First Nations, Athabasca Chippewa First Nations, Keepers of the Athabasca, and Greenpeace. We are currently focusing on energy-related issues such as opposing tar sands expansion, opposing uranium mining, nuclear waste ground suppression, and other aspects of the nuclear industry in Saskatchewan, and working for a transition to renewable energy sources. The members of MIAC are also interested in the broader questions of social justice peace, democracy, and indigenous rights. We are active in seeking answers to the question, how might humanity live sustainably, justly, and peacefully on this finite and fragile, fragile planet? So the question posed to us, to me, is effective organizing for people and the planet. So, of the recurring themes or barriers for me at the front line have been lack of capacity within my role. I'm one person in my organization at the front lines. Within the organization itself, which operates on a very, very small budget, and that's for two provinces. But I'm still the only campaigner. And within the population we work with, so we work with marginalized communities. Uh, so there is a distinct lack of funding, lack of human resources, and lack of infrastructure. So 
our solution to some of these barriers were to work in partnership or create this collective and to build capacity within the environmental justice sector, essentially resource brokering. Another solution is to continue lobbying and being vocal about the need to funnel more dollars into envir the environmental justice sector. That's not to build the capacity of the organization, but it's to help us build capacity within the communities that we work with. All the while building capacity within the marginalized communities we work with through building awareness via education on the issues of environmental justice and providing train the trainer programs in the areas of nonviolent direct action, comms, and anti oppression training, as well as bringing new information into isolated communities that have little or no technology. We also provide information that has been translated into the community indigenous language that we. Um, essentially parachute into and hopefully made the information meaningful to those communities. So in the work that we sorry in the work that we do we constantly are asking the question of how do we address the issues of inequality in those marginalized populations or communities especially or specifically for First Nations and Métis settlements. And I don't know if people are aware, but we are the only province that has eight Métis settlements. And we have legislation that ties us to the land. And it is said that we actually have the largest land-based connection, even over First Nations. So, um, and many of our northern, northeastern settlements are actually at the end of the Tar Sands Belt. So, um, we often forget about those settlements. We are... Um, also being conscientious of the colonial processes clashing with indigenous ways, ensuring that we are not opposing colonial agendas into indigenous knowing, and trying to ensure that the process of engagement is respectful and meaningful. Acknowledging that time, monetary resources, and overall resources may be limited in some communities that do live in the margins. We try to ensure that what we bring into the community does not impact in a negative way, so ensuring that if we are talking to the issues or problems, that we're also talking, or sorry, taking the time to address the solutions and ideally leave the community in a hopeful place rather than adding to an already he heavy burden basket. Um, we talk about the knapsack of white privilege. We have an indigenous burden basket. So with that, um, this is short and sweet. Um, I would define myself as a deconstructualist, but I also define myself as a constructualist in equity building. So with that, um, I'm going to ask that you join us tomorrow at the legislature building at 1 p.m. for the Act on Climate National Solidarity Rally. Uh, let Prentice know that we want to put an end to climate change and ask him to take action to represent us from an Alberta perspective and to talk to spe specifically to those issues. So with that, I'm going to end short and sweet. Thank you, McGwitch. Okay, thank you to all of our guests for the incredible stories that you've shared and the insight that that's provided. I think, Bill, we have time for questions. No, we've got about 10, 10 if minutes. If anybody so. has some questions, Bill will run around with a microphone. Maybe what we could do is let's take uh, two or three comments and questions, and then we can then we can respond. This is relating to the Dogwood Initiative. Are you taking the government to court for I'm not sure what? <laughs> <laughs> so we're gonna have Laura go for your answer. We'll take uh, just write write oh. those down. We'll take uh, two, two or three. We'll get through a few, and then people can respond accordingly. A uh, question for Kelly. Could you comment on um, how many successes you've had through uh, Lead Now over the last several years? Others? Gender balance? Folks? Okay, let's go with those two. We could. Laura, you want to start? Yeah, it's a quick answer. We're not taking the government to court. Um, 
Dogwood really, ha over the years, has tried to really focus, focus, focus on um, a couple of core strategies. For a long time we had only one campaign, now we have two. So we don't have a legal strategy as part of our campaign. Lots and lots of other groups, and particularly First Nations in British Columbia, are taking the government to court. Um, and we certainly do what we can to support those groups in our alliances. And it's, that's, I think there's, there's several pillars to a strategy for addressing, for fixing our democracy and, and um, addressing the, the fossil fuel projects that we're faced with. And one of them is in the courts. It's just not part of what Dogwood does. Uh, thank you for the question. That's uh, It's difficult to answer depending on how you look at it. Um, I think in terms of campaign successes, there are two that we can point to. Um, one, seeing the Reform Act. Um, it was a thing that we got on board with. It was a private member's bill from a conservative. And we said, you know, they're trying something. They're trying, this guy is trying to make an effort to improve our, demo our democracy. And so we got behind that. It was passed unanimously uh, just recently. A little watered down for our tastes, um, but still um, a step forward in the right direction. Um, we also saw in the past year, um, it was a case where we uh, lost the battle but won the war. Um, it was actually a community-led petition that was started in uh, NBC in Summerland. Uh, related to legislation around agricultural uh, land reserves and um, the legislation, we sent out some uh, emails and stuff around that supporting this local grassroots initiative. The legislation didn't pass, but five, six months later when it was time for the municipal elections, um, those people had built such a power base that they were actually elected to the municipal council and got into power to have the power to turn things, you know, to turn it around. Um, other than that, it's been a long uphill battle. Um, we haven't had a ton of successes in terms of campaigns won on the federal level, which is where it became very evident to us that we needed to exercise our power in the electoral realm. Because with this sort of tone deafness and the, you know, deaf, can't hear you, can't hear no evil, see no evil, speak no evil, or I don't know if that's quite accurate to describe Harper, but, um, you know, given the resistance of the Harper government to even pay attention or listen to uh, citizens at large with all of the things that we've been, you know, taking them to task over, um, that's where the change needs to happen. And so that's where we're uh, dedicating a lot of resources right now. Great. I've seen three people put up their hands. We'll take their questions, comments very quickly, and then we'll give the last time for response. A quick question from Laura, uh, and it's about the uh, emphasis on local decision-making power as a strategy. And I'm wondering if we need to be really careful about a potential downside there. The experience of environmental groups in California was that the people who were pushing local decision-making power were the big corporations. Because what they found is it was a whole lot easier to go into a community with their big law resources and everything else and overwhelm a small local community. It was a heck of a lot harder to do so at a state level. So they were all in favor of local decision-making power because they could win more easily. Larry? Sonia? Very quickly. Uh, Jacqueline, just wondering if uh, you've uh, had a chance to do a presentation at Woodland Cree, uh, Lubicon, uh, Pearls and Trout, or uh, Whitefish? I know you work in all those places. Then another question for Jacqueline. Um, just wondering uh, how you know the Mother Earth Action Co-op can be supported uh, because you know you, you listed that the infrastructure is not there and the support's not there. So here's a room full of people that are involved with labor unions, and maybe they can get involved, and maybe they can like even take the anti oppression training that you provide. And where there is isolation, even in the you know, in the mainstream, and could really utilize the services. So, and, and tomorrow, um, I don't know if folks know about why there's a gathering. Um, if you want to just maybe elaborate on uh, what the action is tomorrow. Too. Well, why don't each one at a time respond? Um, just briefly on the downside of the local decision-making power, I would refer you to the case of Kitimat, B.C. Um, I, is anybody familiar with this? So, just about a year ago, 
maybe a year ago today, or a year ago Sunday, um, Kitima, this, is this community of Kitima in Northern BC, where the Enbridge Northern Gateway Pipeline would end, held a plebiscite um, in their local community, asking the question, do we want this pipeline? Uh, Enbridge flew in and did all of the things that you just described. They thought they could buy an election because they're a big multinational corporation. That's what they do. Let's buy an election. It didn't work. And it didn't work because local people decided to organize. They said, well, no way. We're not going to buy that crap. We're going to organize ourselves. We're going to go door to door. And against all the odds in that David and Goliath battle, they won. So local organizing works. Um, people are deeply committed to what they love about their home. And we just really believe that that's where the battle, that's where those David and Goliath battles are gonna, gonna be fought and won is at the local level. So in answer to your question, um, my colleague, Melina Massimo Levican, uh, who works with Greenpeace, has actually been in those communities um, and giving those presentations. And uh, we've also had conversations with keepers of the Athabasca about doing an in situ tour. So those, those presentations are definitely in the works, and uh, we hope to do more education and awareness building in the north in the very near future. Um, in terms of how to build uh, the capacity of uh, MIAC. Um, you know, I, I would like to put it back to the board. Um, we're just sort of trying to evolve what our model will look like in terms of being um, within two provinces with two very distinct agendas, um, related but distinct because they're more focused on nuclear, anti-nuclear um, energy in Saskatchewan. So um, we are trying to find some dollars to hire a campaigner in Saskatchewan. Um, and um, sorry, I just wanted to speak a little bit to the question that was over there in terms of um, some larger ENGOs. Um, when we talk about being very conscientious when we go into communities, it's just ensuring that our agenda is not the priority, that we're um, following the, the agenda of the community and developing at a grassroots level. And so bringing those skills and resources to the community to uh, essentially um, to advocate for themselves and to um, help them develop their own voice. Um, so with that, um, tomorrow, uh, one of the reasons that there is a national sol solidarity uh, event is that we have the 13 premiers who are meeting in Quebec City, I believe it's April 15th. And so the rally is being held two days in advance to essentially get the grassroots voice um, out there and telling these premiers exactly what we hope to see in terms of climate change. Um, so it's ensuring that their agenda is not at the table, that our agenda as a grassroots uh, population, that, that our voice is heard. So let's be loud, let's be proud, and let them know exactly what we want in terms of climate change. to all three of you. I, I think those are great tools that you've used and maybe things we can keep in mind in our own advocacy. Um, I'd just like everybody to join me in thanking all three of these wonderful women for coming.